Ah, <sighs> it's good to be back. Making these takes a lot of time and energy, guys, but I love it, so you're not getting rid of me. And we have a doozy for you today. Now, I've covered a decent range of categories in Pokemon. Gym leaders, villains, rivals, and starters. I think we're deep into the pit enough to start talking about one of the more challenging topics. Legendaries. Particularly the feature title ones that represent each generation. I am not running away from any controversial takes anytime soon. So I figure, why don't I bring yet another Pokemon fan who's also passionate about legendaries and has almost as many hot takes as I do. Please welcome, Count Shaman! Thanks, Ari. Ah! Glad to be here. Can't you make a normal entrance for once? I did once, but I got bored so fast, so I left those manners back home. Just knock like a normal- uh, You know what, let's just move on. So, legendaries, huh? Boy, do I got some knuckles to crack today. Arachnids have knuckles? The more you know. One of the things that grabs a player when they pick up a Pokemon game is the feature legendary. They're featured on the box art, they're often a mysterious part of the opening movie, and treated with a lot of secrecy and reverence. It's a pretty good gimmick. The idea of a Pokemon whose origins are mystical and godlike, with powers that exceed that of any average Pokemon, was very fascinating as a kid. And even now, I can't think of another series that does something like this off the top of my head. While some people only ever see these monsters as endgame trophies, others find enjoyment in their magical designs, intriguing lore, and battle capabilities that belong in their own chaotic tier. And it's by those factors that we will judge them today. We'll be looking to these dominant deities based on these factors. Only legendaries that meet feature standards count. How creative and appealing their design is, how fun and fresh their stories are, how well their battle capabilities stand out, and lastly, are their gimmicks just right, too much, or just plain passe? Like the other collaborative tier list with the spooky lamp boy, compromises have been made. We each have our own favorites and other ones that we wish would just go away already, mom! Stop reading my diary! And we smash them together as best we could. But that also means sometimes you'll hear criticisms in the higher tiers and gushing of the lower tiers. Also, don't expect us to rate a legendary higher than the other just because they're more popular and get more street cred from your parents. If anything, that might be a point deducted due to how much the developers weigh the attention of one legendary over its counterpart when it's supposed to be an equal chance for everyone. We will, however, make exceptions if the attention given to them is backed up by some good stories. With that out of the way, let us begin. So here's where we put the legendary that doesn't quite meet our general criteria as far as feature legendaries go, mainly due to not doing anything special or good enough to justify its presence. And I know just who to sack for this one! I don't like this guy. At all. He's boring. I feel like I just want to pull up my Olympia segment from the gym leaders video because it's just... blah. In the grand scheme of things, Necrozma isn't the worst thing ever. I personally do respect that it tries to do a few things different from the average feature legendary. Having a legendary be the main villain of Ultra Sun and Moon is pretty cool to see. And all the music associated with it are absolutely phenomenal and it really pushes the atmosphere surrounding the mysterious and powerful anomaly of space. But then comes everything else. Necrozma's blended forms don't do anything new. Literally, the types stay the same. Why? Do something cool with the typing! Designs are boring too, like someone threw ink on the originals and was like, Oh cool, I'm done now! Only interesting thing is original's face, and you can barely see it. Then it loses the interesting face with Ultra, plus steals the Lottie Twins typing. Not cool, man. Wouldn't be so bad if it didn't have a lot of the same dragon weaknesses most legendaries have. Doesn't give it any advantage, plus it's another dragon legendary when we already have way too many. Would it have killed you guys to give us something cool like psychic poison or steel poison? We didn't have those at the time and we still don't have steel poison. Bottom line, all of its designs from the appearances to the typings to just the general presence are boring. And on top of that, so much of Sun and Moon's story got altered just to feed into Necrozma's arc. And it's not for the better either. Turning Luzamine into a hero who tries to stop him completely flanderizes the weight of Lily and Gladion's story, when it's originally about the two overcoming the abusive complex of their mother. It feels more like a self-insert fanfiction that retcons one story to feed the other. There are ways to do it well, sure, the series does it all the time, but this is neither the case nor is it worth the hassle. 
Honestly, Ultra Sun and Moon were misfires, and I feel like that's why we didn't get a full-on second game for Gen 8, just an expansion. And probably why we won't get many sequels or the third game in the future. Game Freak realized they were teetering on a line when it came to new concepts, and Necrozma was the breaking point. While it makes me sad that we won't get another Black and White 2, which is what I think they were going for, I'll live with it as long as we don't get another Ultra Disaster. But speaking of Black and White 2... Oh dear, here comes darkness. Kurum was... confusing. And frustrating. And I've never liked it. When Gen 5 first came out, it was just a hassle to deal with getting one. I didn't care about it at all. Maybe that was just my issue, but Kurum never excited me. His design was like an old grandpa that waves a cane around and yells at kids to get off their lawns so they can go to bed at 4.30pm sharp. And his type is unique, but it didn't really feel like it's done in a special way that really grabbed me. I don't know, I guess I was just got really tired of dragons by then. Kurum was once my favorite title legendary. I was way into the hype of Black and White 2 back then. So the idea of a fusion legendary seems so cool and I get so attached to it. Dragon Ice is also a type that I support no matter what, especially since we caught you someone putting those annoying flying dragons in their place. Generally, I still think Kyurem's fun to use, especially with how unique its signature moves are. Over time though, the stench marks really start to show, from its shaggy design and clunky place in the meta game. And then we got the fusions with Zekrom and Reshiram. First of all, I prefer the designs of the other two better. On their own, they are imposing, majestic, and dynamic. The fusions just look like photoshopped abs on a picture of a 90-year-old. It looks wrong, like they're disconnected. Reshiram and Zekrom's designs are sleek and cool, whereas Kiram looks as if a kid dismantled a Barbie and a Transformer and tried to mush them together. Barbformer? Transforby? I don't know, it just feels wrong. While the hype for Kiram was great, it really fell off over time. I still do like it, but I can't pretend that it's the most appealing or interesting legendary up to this point. It's an incomplete gimmick that really could have used some hit streaming. I think should there be another Legends game, we could see Kirim getting his original dragon form and hopefully it looks and plays better than its other ones. I really want some justice for my old friend Game Freak, don't leave him out cold. Okay, finally, we don't have to shit on a legendary I like anymore. Whew. And there was much rejoicing. Anyway, let's talk about Palkia. What, already? See, the problem with the C tiers count is that while you aren't talking smack about them, there isn't a whole lot to say about them either. Take Palkia, for example. Credit where credit is due, Palkia's design is pretty good. It looks intimidating and ancient like it would be a primordial deity. And the typing, while nothing to write home about, is still decent. Frankly, Palkia kind of got the short end of the stick typing-wise, in my opinion. By Gen 4, we'd already seen a dragon water type, and we wanted something new, and we didn't get it with him. It's a good type, but Dialga has the more unique typing, so guess who got more attention? Hey, I'm not complaining. It still works. On top of all the positives you mentioned, Palkia's quite the fighter, having few weaknesses, being faster than a norm, and a signature move that's a lot more practical than Dialga's. I'm an avid lover of space, so having a legendary that embodies that fits just at home with me. Sadly, it's not utilized to its fullest. Game Freak never gave Palkia enough attention to really flesh out its lore. So even for title legendary standards, he's stuck looking like a trophy more than the others. Granted, we do see more space-themed legendaries later on, but the lack of credit given to Palkia is unacceptable. Short Dragon deserves more love, I tell you. Regardless, Palkia works for what it is, and I do sympathize with its need for more respect, given how it's one of the primordial legendaries of the Pokemon universe. I think it got some of that in Legends Arceus, enough to take it out of D tier initially, but there's still a ways to go. The only true gripe I have about it is that while its base form looks really cool and imposing, the origin form is just... <laughs> oh, good morning, fair gentlemen. Don't fucking trouble you to help me, good sirs, for I seem to have misplaced my arms! For all the talk about a typing's credibility for legendaries, let me just say that there are times where I would rather have a used type that still works really well than a unique type that's more detrimental to the Pokemon than anything. That brings us to Lunala. Our good old Moonbat has a lot of perplexing things going for it. On one hand, it does have a unique and downright dazzling design that really feels like a more natural evolution for the Cosmog line. On the other hand, that typing. 
Ghost Psychic, on top of not being a very special type, since most ghost types can already learn psychic moves and vice versa, gives our flappy nocturnal friend here two very common quad weaknesses. Sure, it has a signature ability that protects it from these weaknesses at full health, but it's still too fragile to really make the most out of it. The signature move is... eh, I guess. I mean, it's pretty to look at, but it's kind of just a slightly stronger Shadow Ball with a less practical secondary effect. I'll admit, the typing wasn't a deal breaker for me. I was more excited for Lunala for the newer gens because I love Psychic and Ghost, so putting them together was a dream come true for me. And it's still a fairly unique typing, only Hoopa, Ultra Dawn Wings, Megazord, Voltron, Necrozma, and Shadow Rider Calyrex share it. It's still a Legendaries only club. Not to mention that Lunala is absolutely gorgeous to me. The face is mysterious and alluring, the wings are beautiful, honestly it's one of my favorite legendary designs. It's sleek, it's elegant, it's streamlined. I want to hang it in a museum, I love it so much. And the Blood Moon Shiny, oh my gosh. I guess I was a little mean to Lunala. To its credit, it does have access to better moves and items in recent times that made it a much more viable defensive asset. But I don't know, I still never got that into it. Maybe I would've been more interested if it's a dark psychic type, since then it'll only ever have to worry about bug types, which is far from common in ubers. As it is though, I can see its appeal, it's just not my thing. And I get why others don't like it, the typing is kind of terrible no matter how much I like it, and the defenses could compare to paper, but it still holds a place in my heart. Hey Ari. What's up? It's doggo time. At my house, it's always doggo time. <laughs> Aww, cute doggo! Zamazenta is, by strong definition, an underdog among title legendaries. It's heavily overshadowed by its much more powerful and preferred sister, and to be honest, it's not hard to see why. Zam prefers to walk the path most metal lovers deem unspeakable. The path of a fast wall. To be honest, I do have a soft spot for fast walls. They open up a lot of potential for unpredictable strategies, if they have the asset to pull it off. In Zem's case, not so much. While it can pull off a close combat and guard swap combo, that's pretty much all it can do. It lacks practical tank moves like Body Press and King's Shield, and it can't heal with leftovers since it has to hold onto Rusty Shield to stay in its crown form. Also, while Zacian gets Sacred Sword, which complements its attack power, Zam gets Metal Burst, a move that only works if the user is slower. So yeah, that speed is more detrimental to it than anything else. As for me, I like the typing, but just like Palkia, it's not as special as its counterpart Steel Fairy. Obviously it can be used well, but I'm a little curious as to why they chose a fighting type for a defensive wall. Maybe it's because its weaknesses are mostly special, but fighting is supposed to be an offensive type? I don't understand all the design choices at play. Doggo can go punch punch, but not that good at punch punch, me no understand. That said, I really love his design. He looks regal and fierce. I think I prefer his design over Zacian's because it's a bit cleaner and streamlined. Plus the shield fits into the body, whereas Zacian it feels like an accessory. Despite how much it's lacking compared to other legendaries, I can't really bring myself to dislike Zam. I like that it's not just trying to be another big heavy hitter, and its lore does have a lot of potential to be interesting. Some legendary counterparts gets less than the other, and Shield Bark has it the worst. Not asking to sink pity, but the good boy definitely deserves a break. But seriously, why no King's Shield? Like, isn't that literally what it is? The shield for the kings. It has a shield, like, stapled to it. What the frick? All right, it's time to kick off the B tier. Let's see what we got. Uh, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> you got something to share with the class count? This, my friend, is where we set the world on fire with some draconic hot takes. Wait, you don't mean- Yes, it is time! Bring in the danger noodle! That's it! I quit! I am done with Rayquaza! Please take him away! Everyone else can have him, leave Ari alone! So, uh, putting aside our petty little outbursts, let's be fair and address what makes Rayquaza as important as it is. A sky dragon who commands the respect of not just humans, but fellow legendaries as well. The roar fearsome enough to quell Groudon and Kyogre, and the draconic strength powerful enough to tear through a meteor are nothing to sneeze at. Rayquaza played a dominant role as a protector of the world, and certainly played it well. Yes, he's good. 
Good stats, good story, good design, meh typing, yada, yada, yada. Can we as a society move on, please? There are like over 20 more cool legendaries we could talk about in praise. There is no need to just have this one green spaghetti take all that away from them. Not only that, he was the first in the long, glorious history of dragon type legendaries, so we can blame him for their oversaturation in the meta. And we've talked previously about Game Freak treating certain legendaries better than others, but Rayquaza suffers from something I call Charizard Syndrome. I touched on this in the starter list, but basically Rayquaza not only got the new sparkly shiny thing that came out in that generation, but he got it better and it's broken. Yeah, let's look at that inglorious train wreck. Mega Rayquaza feels like a massive devaluation of what makes Rayquaza special. What was once a legendary respected for its authority to put a stop to world ending disasters, is now a disaster of its own. Game Freak is so desperate to make him a super powerful Pokemon that surpasses Primal Groudon and Kyogre, that he became a glorified meta breaker, distracting from what made him respectable to begin with. Sure, a lot of Megas do that, but Rayquaza takes it in a direction that's just plain ridiculous to the point where I don't really have an attachment for him anymore. Sure, it may be fun to see these stats for a while and not being bound to a specific held item, but all it connotes is that literally any Pokemon can be the strongest thing ever with a wave of a hand and it didn't even have to make sense. And when the devs had to start drawing attention to other Pokemon and their feature titles, they scrapped all the hype put on by that previous power trip. This is why I don't believe in judging a Pokemon's worth based on power scaling alone. Because no matter how big and strong you may think you are, someone or something will knock you off that pedestal. Seriously people, I thought we already learned this lesson since Arceus in Gen 4. I will give the Game Freak favoritism one point in its favor. I did enjoy the Delta episode. It was a nice post-game surprise, especially since I was kind of tired of just having a battle zone for the post-game, and the twists were pretty cool the first time around. And I love Zinnia, her theme, her design, her psychology, just Mwah! oh yes, I love Zinnia. We're not saying you can't love Rayquaza for being as OP as it is. You're free to do so. It's just that based on our criteria, we have much stronger favorites, and we'd like to highlight those a lot more rather than pretending to love something we don't. So with all due respect, enjoy your big gummy serpent, but keep it far away from us if you call. Hoo wee, we sure burnt a lot of bridges with that one, yeah? It was indeed exhilarating. Coach you something a bit more soothing next. Uh hoo, I'll worry not. I got just the tune for that. <laughs> the hipster primal did it before Kyogre and Groudon made it cool. I've always loved Dialga. I chose Diamond first because he just caught my eye. He looked like a royal dinosaur with crystals for his crown. Little middle school Ari was so hyped for the pretty jewelry mon. I love the typing. We didn't get another one like it until Duro Ludon, and it's just great against the newer darling fairy type. I also prefer his domain. Space gives me anxiety, but I've always loved the idea of traveling through time. I'd love to observe, not live in, older societies, so Dialga's specialty was also a huge draw for me. And the way his signature move looked back then was so... Freaking amazing! I'll admit, Dialga didn't sit right with me at first. I always thought its design looked goofy, and in battle, it lacks the practicality Palkia has since its signature move is just a Hyper Beam clone that puts it at a vulnerable spot. That said, its unique typing and rule over time definitely has its appeal, and I'd be lying if I say I'm not interested in what it does. And then came Explorers of Darkness and Time, literally in my top 5 favorite games ever. And Dialga being the primary antagonist for the main game is just YES QUEEN SLAY! The battle was difficult if you didn't know what you were doing, you had to think around the problem since Dialga was resistant to most of the Pokemon you as the main character could be. Or you could cheese the system to get one of the non-starter starters like Munchlax or Machop or whatnot. <laughs> Cheaters. Compared to Palkia, Dialga's stories are just more fleshed out in general. I usually hate dev bias when it comes to legendaries, but Dialga is handled so beautifully I can't be too mad about it. So even though I still prefer Palkia, I'll keep cherishing the respect I do have for our mighty time dragon for what he did well. I still hate the origin form to death though. That will never change. Ah, it's like boom, 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 boom. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm stealing this from Kingdom Hearts. The closer you get to light, the greater your shadow becomes. So, our shadows are a giant black dragon of balance? Better than a big old noodle heartless. You're right, that is better. Well, this has to happen eventually. We have to pick our lesser favorite of the Tau dragons, and Zekrom bit the bullet. Now, don't get us wrong, Zekrom is as fascinating as it looks. 
Being the strength-driven dragon sibling who powers the skies with electricity bursting from its massive generator of a tail. Both it and Reshiram represent the contrast between elegance and aggression well with their respective elemental themes of soft, airy flames and strong, striking lightning bolts. It's pretty inspiring. I am not as big a fan of Zekrom. It's got some good points, like the typing. Dragon Electric! I hadn't even thought of it at the time, but as soon as I heard it, I wanted it. And its design does suit its typing, I guess. Sleek, imposing, almost industrial. But I didn't like the design as much as I liked Reshrooms, and I didn't like the name either. I don't know why, Zekrom felt more like a Yu-Gi-Oh card than a Pokemon to me. Speaking of design, I feel like that's very clearly why so many people, fans and devs alike, love it so much that it overshadows Reshiram altogether. Of course Zekrom would be the popular choice. It's so cool and edgy! Like seriously, between being the talk of social media and becoming the face of conquest when Reshiram was secluded to an event, it's ridiculous how a legendary that's supposed to be one part of a duo about balance keeps being put on the spotlight over its counterpart. Consistency? Thy name is not Game Freak. Its stats don't thrill me either. When I hear Dragon Electric, I think of something that's fast and hits like a truck. 90 speed is nothing to sneeze at, but it's pretty slow for uber standards. It doesn't match with its sleek design and typing. Frankly, I'd have swapped the speed stat with the special attack stat and it would have solved a lot of the disconnect in my opinion. All that being said, it's a good, well-rounded Pokemon. Not necessarily my thing, but good. And next up is the flying bacon! I'm sorry, what? Look at it! I could fry that up in a pan and it would be delicious. Why do you and Wambu keep trying to eat Pokemon? Well, then again, I'd probably eat a crab roller if I could. <laughs> Alas, after six generations in the making, we finally have an official Angel of Death in the Pokemon world. Might seem extreme to some, but hey, given the natural evolution of legendaries throughout the series, it's about time we get extreme. Anyways, Yveltal is what you'd expect from a legendary bird of death. Red and black design, typing related to darkness, and a signature move that essentially embodies the role of a life taker. Sure, it's pretty much the infinite to Zekrom's shadow, but surprisingly, it's not the bigger favorite of the two aura legendaries. So, kinda hard to put it down for that. Joking about the bacon burb aside, Eveltal and I have a weird relationship. While I understand that legendaries can't always be original, I won't lie and say I wasn't disappointed with the typing on this one. I get it, dark type in Japanese is actually the evil type. Death is evil, yada yada, but why isn't it a ghost type? As in already dead. Cremated. Deceased. This is an ex-parrot for the death Pokemon! Well, whether you like the type or not, the crazy lore absolutely sells it for me. Apparently, Yveltal is so intertwined with the role of a life taker that when it dies, it straight up takes the life of everything near it so it can be reborn again. Basically what happens if ho -Oh swallows an atom bomb. I also love the ongoing theory about it being blind, given the empty look on its eyes. It fits well with the concept of death not picking favorites and how it could come to anyone. It's such a grim approach, yet given what we've seen with Pokemon up to this point, I'm not terribly surprised it comes to this. I do have to be honest and say that I think the original design is cool. I wouldn't have put the god of death as a bird, so that surprised me. I was thinking with the Norse influence that the death god would be Jormungand or even Fenrir because of Ragnarok, and the spectator would be the eagle, maybe Odin's ravens Hugin and Munin, but that's just my two cents. As of now, I've gotten over my slight typing disappointment and can honestly say that Iveltal is pretty cool, and I love its signature move. Anything that gets stabbed and can suck the life out of your opponent is okay by me but I'd still rather take its buckhorned counterpart any day. Here comes the sun, I say. Get in the bag, Nebby! Sol Galio, boy, what do I have to say about you? Gen 7 may not have the most solid title legendaries, but there's something about Sol in particular that just really sticks with me. A steel psychic legendary doesn't seem like a big deal anymore since the type is not even original. But... Think about it. This is a generation where fairies dominate the meta. You need a Steel-type legendary to keep things in order. And I'd say Sol did a great job thanks to a competent ability that keeps it from debuffs, decent attack and speed, and an accurate physical Steel-type move as its signature, making it an optimal wall breaker, especially to the glamouring fairies. He may seem… average, and sure, you can make fun of him being weak to fire all you want, but don't underestimate how important Steel-types can be on the offense. Now yes. I like the typing. Sure, it's not original. Jirachi had that same typing four generations ago, but it's still a pretty decent combination. I sense a however coming on. However, 
I'm real happy for you, Solgaleo, and I'm gonna let you finish, but why did we get a lion in Gen 7 when we had another very similarly designed lion in Gen 6? Don't get me wrong, I think that the base design looks cool, but there's a whole bunch of dissonance with that that I can't get over. Why a lion? Couldn't have been any other animal. Solga Tigre. Ooh, I wish I could draw so I could draw that sun tiger. Eh, you know what? I don't mind. Pyro sucks anyway, so Solgaleo's design did work out on me as a competent lion Pokemon. The mane represents the vibrance of the sun adequately, and the thought of riding something like it through the dimensional portals just feels like it'd be a fun time, you know? I sense a disturbance in the Steven Universe Force. I do have one other major issue. Lunala looks like it evolved from Nebi, but Solgaleo looks like a completely different line except the face. I feel like it could have connected better with its previous stages. Please keep in mind that I do love its design as a standalone. If there was no Nebi or Lunala or even Pyroar, it'd be amazing. But with all that into account, it's just a little out of place to me. Overall, I think it's a good legendary. I just have some petty hangups. And now we talk about the superior doggo. Anyone who follows me on Twitter knows I love dogs, especially mine. So having legendaries based off of dogs, confirmed dogs, not the super speedy hamsters from Gen 2, is right up my alley. And Zacian just hits all so many good boy buttons for me. For example, I love the story with the Z-Doggos, how they were stalwart companions to the king and helped found Galar and saved everyone thousands of years ago. That's exactly the story I wanted from Doggo Legendaries. Dogs are known to be man's best friend after all. Between the two warrior dogs, it's kind of insane how much better Zacian is. Like, I'm all for vouching for underdogs, but Zacian is so ridiculously superior, it's hard not to be impressed. Being a fast fairy steel type that can hit as hard as an 18-wheeler through the ultimate life form just makes me crave to see it rip that giant noodle a good one. Its moveset may be barren, but it still gets the moves it needs to be fully utilized. You can't go wrong with Swords Dance, Player Off, Behemoth Blade, and Sacred Sword. Even though it's not the tank, its defenses aren't bad, and that attack stack, ugh, yes, hit things, hit all the things. Also, the typing is awesome. Suck it, Ma, while Zacian came to shred things. The typing gives it a lot of resistance and immunity to two very common competitive types. Seriously, it's an amazing legendary. So why is it only B tier count? Well, as cool as Zacian might be, the one thing I feel holds it back significantly, alongside Zem, is its lore. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not a bad lore. It's just that the idea of two warrior dogs fighting to save Galar from destruction feels like something that deserves more looking through with its origins and details. We definitely could have used that in the post-game, where we quote dive into the past and see how the hero bonds with the two dogs and gain their respect. But that's apparently too good to be true. Instead, what did the post-game give us? The Ninetales Phallus Bros. <sighs> We have reached A tier. Whew, we are getting to the real juicy stuff. So what's the first spicy take? Glad you asked. Some of you who've seen me for quite a bit are probably aware that I have a record for dropping Mac diss tracks on them Firebirds. Well, worry not, because you're gonna get to see me praise an avian of flame for once. Behold, Pokemon's Messenger of Rebirth, a deity that never stays dead no matter how often Game Freak forgets about it. The original Phoenix, ho -Wo. I love this damn bird. Everything about it screams bright as fire. Its design is strong, colorful, and regal enough to captivate the gold and rainbow feel that it's meant to give off. And that boss fight atop the bell tower is just perfection. With its boss theme being so daunting and thematically appropriate, and fighting it in the harsh sunlight really puts into perspective that you're fighting THE bona fide fire boss of the Pokemon world. This is really Count's pick, not gonna lie, but I do have a couple things to say. Ho-Oh is beautiful. I didn't appreciate it a lot when I was younger because of my obsession with Lugia. Plus, there already were fire-flying Pokemon. But now that I'm older, I appreciate its music theme, the signature move, the aesthetic, it's great. Though there was one thing I found surprising while I was digging in a little deeper. It's a special tank, but a physical attacker? Was not expecting that. Oh, is it ever. Battle-wise, Ho-Oh is the butterfree of Ubers. As in, it doesn't look like it'll do much, but anyone who can utilize it properly can find that it's a very formidable legendary that has lasted across multiple generations. A combination of great offensive typing, amazing attack, and special defense fit to cripple special base Pokemons, Sacred Fire's high chance to deal burn against physicals, and a combination of heavy-duty boots and regeneration making it a great switch installer, Ho-Oh can cover just about any front fantastically. 
It's honestly jarring that it took the company almost 30 years to give Ho anywhere near as much attention as Lugia. Getting to reunite with Ash and fight him in I Choose You, and its lore was done some real justice in Pokemon Generations. Well done, fellas. Now do these guys. People can shun the good Phoenix and pick it apart for being inferior to Lugia all they want, but I've had its back for years now, and I'm glad I stayed because Ho Oh deserves its second chance to shine. On the other hand, this next Pokemon is so ingrained in legendary bias that it's almost too much. I'm gonna need some Ritalin. If I'm being honest though, I bought into the hype. I literally picked up a Ruby because I liked Groudon. I liked its coloring, I liked its design, I just liked it. It was red, so it was mine. Furthermore, Groudon looks like a deity of the earth. Magma colored, excavator tail, menacing dinosaur look, since you know, dinosaurs are buried in the earth and get turned into vroom vroom juice that makes our cars go and cost a few fingers per gallon now. Anyways, the design is spot on. And I didn't even care that Kyogre would obviously win back then, I just love Groudon. Groudon is a very special case for me. I used to have a really deep stigma against the Magma Dweller because even compared to the likes of Lugia and Rayquaza, Groudon really overstays its welcome as a series staple. Not only does it always appear as a main boss on most spin-offs while Kyogre got sidelined, but in the big climactic anime fight, it didn't even beat Kyogre fair and square. It hid behind Pikachu! F***ing Pikachu! How can you call yourself a legendary when you had to be rescued in the arms of a pathetic little ro- oh. Better? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Putting aside my agenda, I did grow to appreciate Groudon more over time. A deity of Earth is definitely something the series needs, and it does have a design that helps it fit in a lot of environments, hence he's such a popular pick for boss fights. As for Primal Groudon, I do believe it helps boost its credibility as a magma dweller with its new part fire typing. The ability is ridiculous, but not to the point where he's untouchable, since his low speed and common weakness to ground and special attack still keeps it down to Earth. There's still a degree of balance to how Groudon was buffed that is fresh but also sensible compared to Mega Ray. Groudon is a powerhouse and I always dreaded trying to catch it without using the Master Ball because since you have to be careful not to kill it, he could sweep my team while refusing to get in the ball. Primal Groudon on the other hand, I didn't care for it as much as the original Groudon honestly. I'm not sure why, maybe it was like they were trying to put rhinestones on something that I had already thought was perfect, I don't know. It's fine, I'm not mad at it. In fact, the new abilities and typing only help it, really. I'm just one of those people. I don't like change. Some Pokemon look intimidating. Like if you look at them wrong, they'll murder you. Pokemon kind of like Graplocked, Garchomp, Drudagon, anything with really angry eyes. And then there's Puff the Magic White Dragon. Mushed, Gaidol. First off, Reshiram is fluffy and gorgeous and I want to hug its eyebrows. Also, it's apparently my husband's most attractive Pokemon. Secondly, while I do feel that Dragonfire is the weaker of the two combinations, it's not like Reshiram does anything bad with it. It is a special powerhouse and given how many amazing fire and dragon type moves it gets in its moveset, it gets stabbed where it needs it. Personally, I find Dragonfire to be superior in general. It's weak to the less common rock type as opposed to Zekrom's standard weakness to ice, and fire essentially helps cover all of Dragon's shortcomings, from ice to steel. Sure, it comes short in speed, but hey, so do most legendaries at its time, so not a big deal. I also love the way its signature moves, Fusion Flare and Blue Flare, look. They're majestic and you really feel the power behind it. But to be honest, I don't have a lot of concrete, finite, definitive reasons for liking Reshiram. I liked it better at first sight, so I got black version and my brother got white because he wanted Zekrom. I think it's amazingly solid. If it were just me doing this list, Reshiram would probably be S tier. I have to say also, in story terms, Reshiram really feels like N's Pokemon. The sense of elegance and freedom between trainer and Pokemon feels like it reflects best with his pair. So even if I pick white as my version, Reshiram still struck more of a chord with me than Zekrom did due to the fitting role it plays as a Pokemon that matches the core story that N, and by extent, Team Plasma carries through. Frankly, Game Freak needs to pay Reshi more respect. This is about the worst gen they could have had legendary bias due to the concept of balance so ingrained into the story. Then again, Gen 5 isn't exactly famous for that concept of balance spilling over to competitive. <coughs> Weather meta. <coughs> oh, jeez. <coughs> You know, Ari, I gotta be honest. I feel like sometimes legendaries don't really go nearly as far as they should. Like, with all the possible type combos we can get, 
we still lack a definitive poison type legendary. And in an era where poison types are getting more viable, there's really no excuse to hold back anymore. Uh, bruh? That big kid over there wants to talk to you. That's what I'm talking about! Holla frickin' Luya! There's a poison type legendary, a fairy killing destroyer of all things, Eldritch Abomination legendary. Sign me up! Like, y'all know I don't love the bad guy team for Gen 8, but while Game Freak dropped the ball on motivation for them, their endgame was just... breathtaking. With Eternatus, everything is correct. The design, creepy as frick, dissolved looking dragon that got eaten from the inside out with its own acid. The spectacle, oh my gosh, 100 meter long check. The music, the little flute trill going off like it's your heart fluttering its last little bit before it being stomped on by an ancient, almost otherworldly orchestral soundgasm. Ah, this music is amazing! Just as much as we need steel type behemoths nowadays, a poison type legendary gives the fairy some middle ground to reach. Having monstrous special attack and speed gives it real dominance even among uber giants. Couple that with its huge move pool giving it access to some great fire and ghost type moves to negate its weakness to psychic and steel. Oh, and forget about trying to dynamax cheese this guy. Its signature move only smiles to your downfall. Now whether Eternatus counts as a title legendary is debatable, but it is featured in both versions of Gen 8 and is part of the main story with similar skyrocketing stats. Plus it has direct ties to Zacian and Zamazenta lore-wise, so I say it does count. It's just as downright scary as it's supposed to be. A continental terror, dripping power and death from the sky in an inescapable storm. And the size, the weight of the atmosphere, it's, well, frankly, everything I wanted from Ivaltal. Yeah, I said it. Eternatus is a better death god than Bloodwing over there. Ivaltal honestly feels like Eternatus' minion at this point. Like he's only a death deity because Eternatus lets him be one. Frankly, I think I like him as a concept more than some of the S tier candidates here, but I don't enjoy using him in battle much, so that's why I nominated him for A tier. On another note, I'd like to point out that Eternamax is, to date, the most broken Pokemon ever. Its HP and defenses are so criminally high that if it reaches its cap, it resets back to zero where it becomes practically impossible to damage. Even in Hackmons, this indestructible hand of death is considered too much. Yeah, good thing he's not playable, huh? Alright, S tier time. Can't wait to talk about this one. I can't wait to be more basic than a white blonde chick in Ugg boots at Starbucks buying a pumpkin spice latte. Back in the before times, before Facebook and Twitter ruled the world, back when music was grunge and whiny and amazing, there was the Gen 1. And there was one mon to rule them all, and his name was Mewtwo. Those of you who saw my previous collab will know that while the rest of the world might be Gen 1 or Charizard simps, I have to disagree. I am so over the hype on Charizard. I get it, he's cool looking. He's a big Durgan who isn't actually a Durgan and I had that holographic card too that has been lost to time. But I will always be a Mewtwo stan. Mewtwo is the original beast. The original scary, you're not strong enough yet obstacle that kept you from completing the game. And unlike the legendaries from Gen 3 onwards, it wasn't mandatory that you meet him in order to finish the game. He could easily have remained a big mystery. And unlike Ho-Oh and Lugia, he's almost never mentioned. He's just... this presence. I gotta be honest, I don't have a lot to say about Mewtwo. While I grew up with Gen 1 like most, Mewtwo never really struck any chords with me. I never got that much into his mystery, I didn't grow up with his movies, and I don't consider Smash Bros. Melee the bread and butter of my childhood either. That said, I do get why he means a lot to the fans. As Gen 1's technical title legendary, Mewtwo is the first Pokemon that felt legitimately unstoppable. High stats, typing that's broken for its time, and having to go through a fair lot of the games to reach him. He does feel like the Pokemon who serves as a testament to how far you've come in your journeys. I'm admittedly jealous of the people who did get so attached to him because I do wish I could be one of them. I was there when Shadow the Hedgehog was still all the rage, so I might be into Mewtwo as well if the conditions were met. I don't normally like to use the anime for the tier lists. However, I'm going to freely admit that the anime movies, the first movie and Mewtwo Returns, were the reasons why I started caring about actually finding and catching this boy. 
I never did, but he was always in the back of my mind. I will also freely admit that Smash Brothers played a part in it too, but I'm rambling. Mewtwo has kept up his legacy. He's still strong, still imposing, his design is still good. Psychic has gotten balanced as the years have gone on, but he's still an actual terrifying presence on the battlefield if you don't know what you're doing. One can also still compare him to Jarazar because he also got two different Megas, he's still getting buffs and heaps of cool things to this day, but unlike Charizard who is so in your face, Mewtwo feels like a privilege to have. You don't just get him given to you, you have to earn him and I really appreciate that. Ah! What's wrong? Nothing is wrong, all is right in the world because it's time to talk about my baby! Here he is, my favorite legendary since I was seven years old. Not kidding, he's still my favorite, and I picked Silver Version because he was on the cover. I had never seen something as majestically confusing as Lugia. With a lot of the other Pokemon from Gens 1 and 2, with the exception of godforsaken Dunsparce, you could pretty easily tell what they were. Teddy Bear! Pokeball! Scary as frick clown! Lugia was the first, what is this Pokemon for me? Lugia is very fascinating for me because while most legendaries try to be mass destroyers of the planet, Lugia instead opts to be a wall. And while it has dwindled in quality over time, at its prime, it's one of the most fun Pokemon to use in the tier for me. What it lacks in the big moveset Ho-Oh has, it makes up for it by utilizing the defensive areas better. Multiscale absorbs a hit so it can set up a good amount of time, and access to a handful of good recovery moves helps its case too. My only gripe is that Psychic Flying is kind of a dumb type for this Pokemon. Not only does it have a lot of weaknesses, but it doesn't really reflect its role as a sea guardian or a beast with silver wings in any way. I'd rather it be a steel flying type at least. I still love him. His special music in the Gen 4 remix was amazing. Did you know legendaries didn't get their own special music until Suicune got it in Gen 2? And he still makes me feel powerful whenever I'm able to catch him. But once again, it is the anime to blame for cementing my love of the Guardian of the Seas. While I was first drawn to him from the games, it was Pokemon the Movie 2000 that made me fall completely in love with him. From the smooth voice to his utter power, I was in awe. Mewtwo was powerful, but Lugia was majestic. Heck, I use his flute theme from the movie as the intro to my D&D campaign, Ladies Night. That hasn't been updated in a while, I'll work on that. Like Dialga, a lot of Lugia's screen time is spent wisely. The fact that so much of its lore is so well fleshed out makes it hard to really put it down for being overexposed. It's not just Game Freak's pretty poster boy, it's an actual character with a story to tell. And despite my dilemma as a ho -Oh fan, I do respect it for that. Lugia may have been a sea guardian, but it's no sea deity I tell you. To find that, we gotta dive into the trenches where the demons dwell and the pointy teeth leviathans live about. Big fish with pointy teeth. <laughs> as long as I don't look at it, I should be okay. Kyogre is best boy, son, brother, father, and husband though. Fight me. His design? Holy fuck! Do you know how happy I was to find that there's an Orca Pokemon? As a kid, I was mad impressed to learn that Orcas are predators to the all-powerful Great White Sharks. Knowing that they're such intelligent and social creatures as well, got me all the more interested in their biology. So when I first saw Kyogre, I didn't even think twice about selecting him as one of my go-to comfort Pokemon. Kyogre itself is pretty great. I'm a fan of water types. This was the first water type legendary, so I was already on board. But me being a silly little preteen, I liked red more than blue, so I bonded with Groudon a bit more than Kyogre. Wanna know something fun? I called him Kyogre when I was a kid. Hey, I'd stopped watching the anime by this point. I didn't know how it was pronounced. And one thing in its favor specifically for me. Unlike Groudon, I really love its primal reversion, even with the teeth. I, ju I just don't look at those. I feel like they did the ethereal primordial superpower better with him, with the yellows and oranges swirling around its head balls. It's like almost hypnotizing. Battle-wise, Kyogre is an uber veteran for a good reason. Fantastic special stats coupled with a move pool that's small but provides necessary coverage. Drizzle in general is too good an ability as is the base for a lot of rain teams as well as for thunder hurricane specialists. Is he the most complex Pokemon stat-wise? No but he worked back then, and he still does now. The Primal Reversion is honestly just overkill. If not for it having to match Primal Groudon in power level, it won't even need it. It has no reason to be insecure like Groudon is. When it comes to these title legendaries, Kyogre's always been kind of a big time underdog. You'd think being a giant dolphin, he'd be used for more water type boss fights, but he got sold short even on that front. The competitive scene is pretty much the only place it's mostly welcomed, which is a little sad. 
My point exactly. People have their own underdogs that they cling on to and won't let go regardless of how the tides change, but I'd be lying if I say I don't share the same complex. No matter what people say to put him down, I will continue to stay on Kyogre's side. Besides, a world under Kyogre's reign is still far more thrivable than a world ruled by Groudon, so Team Aqua for life. So my brothers and sisters, have y'all heard of God? Because Pokemon found Jesus in Gen 4 and his name is Arceus. Subtlety, thy name is not Ari. Subtlety is for quiet people, but on to Poke Jesus. While I don't love his design, one of those walker thingies from Dark Crystal in a tutu, uh, he has grown on me. I never got to play with him. He was just this presence, kind of like Mewtwo, but he was Pokemon God, not just a man-made super weapon. I wasn't sure what I was expecting. He was suitably scary in Pokemon Conquest, I was not expecting him to show up, and that was honestly the first time I saw him. I didn't have a lot of thoughts on him because I never experienced him other than that one spin-off game. I got a taste of his gimmick with Type Null in Gen 7, but never the full meal. As I do consider myself an Arceus fan, I do find it pretty dang cool that Game Freak actually has the gall to slap a creator of the universe into a series about pocketable pets, and even have it join the fray. Whether that causes controversy in the community or the religious circles of the world is its own separate matter, so let's look at how he fights. As the alpha of Pokemon, his stats are unsurprisingly all excellent. While he can't exactly learn every move, he does have multi-type, which essentially makes him a trump card that can cover any bases a team lacks. Of course it's easy to misuse Arceus if you think he'll win your battles in an instant without having to try, which led to him being such a huge meta laughing stock before Mega Rayquaza took the spot. His reputation as the god of Pokemon isn't received well either due to him being sidelined as a mythical in Gen 4, giving people hardly any investment to really get attached to him. But then, the Legends game. The age where Arceus is one with the title legendaries. Aside from the game being incredibly fun, Arceus upped his presence in the game a hundredfold. Not only did he summon you, the player, to this world, not only had he been guiding you through your phone, which is literally the only design choice I think is stupid, not gonna lie, but you fight him like one of the rampaging lords. Oh my gosh. And his music! Ugh! I'm listening to it as I write, and it's so good! His fight is absolutely horrifying in all the good ways. The amount of laser shows and reality bending really puts into perspective how otherworldly your opponent is. Totally makes up for having to deal with those laughable origin forms. Wanda, you see in this, here's the real witch. Not only does beating him earn you his respect, but you even get the legend plate, which allows it to transform into any type in battle to fit the opponent's weakness. Could you imagine how broken that would be in competitive? Something I must say I appreciate a lot about Legends Arceus is that even after what so many of the legendaries went through, Arceus stays the same. They could have made us see his true form that encompasses all creation in the Pokemon world, but they didn't. Arceus remains ambiguous while still giving more exploration to his lore via world building. Knowing that the Pokemon Arceus that you see is merely one of its many arms slash avatar sort of explains how there's many different Arceus in the various worlds or save files. It makes a lot of sense for his lore and it really rejuvenates the mystery and fun surrounding the alpha Pokemon after it's been lost for so long. Nowadays, legendaries have to succumb to a lot of gimmicks just to stick out and stay relevant. Some even try to be even cooler only to embarrass themselves with how ridiculous they turn out. Arceus may not be the strongest Pokemon, but a true epitome of Pokemon should know that there's more to being great than just numbers on stats. People cherish Pokemon for different reasons, and Arceus remaining as he is gives the impression that he understands the essence of what defines a Pokemon. Mad respect for staying profound in a period where legendaries have grown less subtle over time. You know how Bambi lost his mom and that really took a toll on him, realizing how harrowing death can be? Have you ever wondered if he might have hated death so much because of that, to the point where he harnessed the power of life and grew up to become a life bringer who will save others from the same fate? How much did you drink before writing that fanfiction count? Moving on, it's Rudolph the Pride Parade Reindeer, Xerneas. Once again, my first impressions served me well. I saw the two legendaries for X and Y, immediately chose Xerneas, and I did not look back. Xerneas is either based on the four stags who nom on the world tree in Norse mythology, or possibly Eichfinir specifically, who stands guard for and eats at Valhalla's roots, as Valhalla is known for being the resting place for Odin's chosen great warriors in order to prepare to rise again for Ragnarok, I'm thinking it's probably the latter. But that almost doesn't matter, I know, blasphemy, when you look at how pretty it is. 
Oh, the rainbows, the elegant points on its limbs, the symmetry. Death the kid would be so happy. Just mwah! I'll be honest, I thought I was going to prefer a Yveltal at first. But after giving Xerneas a more thorough look, I realized how beautiful and unique its design really is. I love the sleek and slender deer form, and the neon antlers just gives it that unique fantastical feel I always crave when it comes to these legendaries. Even more so is its lore as the guardian of life. Not a lot of stories really tackle the mystique of a life deity, and we can see how it plays out in Super Mystery Dungeon, where Xerneas guards the Tree of Life and carries the power to personally evolve Pokemon. As for new Pokemon Snap, it's one of the Illumina Guardians who commands the respect of nature itself. And then there's the fact that it's a fairy type, so the curiosity for how it works adds all the more to the appeal. Being the first fairy type legendary, it made a great impression. Overall, I would say that X and Y are the weakest of the Pokemon games, but the best thing we got out of it was Xerneas, a pretty decent mixed attacker with an interesting move pool. Okay, it's not perfect. It only gets Moonblast as an offensive stab. I know it was the first one. Leave Brittany alone. But it gets other amazing moves like Horn Leech, Mega Horn, Thunderbolt, and Flash Cannon. So yeah, Xerneas good reindeer. And of course, there's Geomancy, a busted signature move that lets it double its special and speed stats. Slap a power herb on that bad boy and you got yourself a colossal titan on rollerblades. It was certainly a fun time when the uber meta shrieks over the might of this fearsome buck. But its shallow special move pool does make it less broken, which I suppose is fair. Still, there's a lot to love about Xerneas, and I do trust that his addition to the legendary roster was the breath of fresh air we all needed. Hmm, now that's strange. What's strange? We've made it to S tier and talked about the last legendary on the generations order, yet I can't help but to feel like we're missing one. Oh, you've made a grave mistake, Count. For every second you remain unaware of its presence, it knows. It sees you in the shadows and bides its time before it exacts its long-contained wrath. You alright, Ari? What did you do with the lights? It comes for all. Come on, you all know we had to do this. No matter how often the community bickers about their favorites, just about everyone unanimously agrees that Giratina is one of, if not, the best legendary Pokemon in every aspect imaginable. Guys, I'd been wanting a ghost legendary since Gen 2. I love ghost types. It's right in my top 5 favorite types. So imagine my utter despair when I've only ever owned one copy of Platinum and it got given away or borrowed or something. It disappeared before I could ever meet. Giratina. I still have yet to ever own one. I want one so badly. And I know he's in Arceus Legends, but just ugh, I haven't gotten there yet, guys. Gen 4 is already my favorite lore-wise and villain team-wise. They worked really hard to flesh out the world of Pokemon and focus on the balance of time, space, creation, and all the human aspects. But then there's the darkness, the negative energy, the dissonance of the universe. And that's where Giratina lives. The distortion world is literally one of the coolest concepts ever done in a Pokemon game. No other main series game has broken their own physics like that, and Giratina is the cause. Arceus may control our world, but in Giratina's world, you are a helpless little worm bent to his will if he so chooses. Giratina's design is such a massive disparity from Dialga and Palkia. None of that bright regal stuck-up sh**. We're going goth tonight. Both forms of Giratina really strike the right balance of intimidation and badassery without going full edge. Between the altered form's golden hexapetal dragon with claw-like wings to Origin's golden basilisk with shadowy tentacles, it nails both in excellence. Whether it's attack or defense, Giratina has the stats to go double duty thanks to its forms. Shadow Force, while not a practical move, still has the edge in tearing through Pokemon with Protect and Detect up. It's nothing to shrug. I had never been scared of a Pokemon before. That changed when I saw that pool of black and those red eyes pop out of the ground on top of the spear pillar for the first time. Thanks early internet videos! I can't even really explain why he's so frightening. He's just pixels and code, but there's that sheer existential dread, that stink of almost hell about him, and it freaks me out, and I love it! I don't know why, but I love it! I call Eternatus an Eldritch Abomination, but honestly, Giratina probably deserves that title a little more. Darkrai is not the nightmare Pokemon, the king of the distortion world is. And then there's the Legends Arceus fight. Oh boy, 
Even the people who complain about the new Pokemon games being too easy find themselves quivering before the might of the Distortion Beast. As one of the final bosses of the game, Giratina reeks of power, proven by how easily it can one-shot any average Pokemon. And if you thought you just gotta take it down once like any other legendary, think again. It goes right into its origin form and jumps straight for a Shadow Force killing streak. So as if it doesn't look scary enough, it manages to find a way to strike terror even in gameplay. With how far legendaries in the series have come and how their qualities shift between each generation, I believe a lot of us will continue to love the renegade dragon of the Pokemon world for many generations to come. Whew, that was a long one. Thanks for the pleasure, Ari. I'm glad to cover a topic of the past as elaborately as we did. You're welcome, boyo. Though that begs the question. You don't enter like a normal whatever you are. Do you exit like a normal one? Funny you shall ask that. I normally... <coughs> Wait, you can't do this to me. I work here. <sighs> it's been way too long since we used this. Hopefully the gunpowder buildup didn't yeet him through time again. Next week would be weird. <laughs>